right, we'll go ahead and get started here. Um, we've got two more weeks, right? Yeah, two more weeks. Rod's saying yes. I just want to make sure my calendar is going right. So two more weeks, guys, and then we'll be breaking for the summer. But then through the summer, we're going to have summer sessions, um, a couple of different evenings. We're going to be going over um, how to, on the Wednesday nights, how to use the catechism as a way of training uh, children, grandchildren. Uh, it's just going to be a, a great time. We're going to be having some fun fellowshipping, hanging out. The kids will be meeting down here. The adults will be meeting actually up in room nine, the youth room upstairs, uh, because we won't be able to hear each other if we were somewhere else outside of here. So grab one of those calendars on your way out tonight. Be looking for that. Uh, I'm excited for this. It's going to be really fun. So tonight we're going to just be looking over the literary genre, and then we're going to break into our pods. And remember, when we break into our pods, if you could just distribute yourselves evenly as we can throughout these, these pods here. But hopefully everyone's been enjoying the hermeneutics class. And th this is going to really help us get to understand when we approach the text, how can we get more out of our Bible reading? How can we get more out of our Bible study? And specifically tonight, we are going to look at the literary genres. Uh, but before we jump into that, I'm going to go ahead and pray, and then we'll jump into our lesson for this evening. Dear Gracious Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for who you are. Thank you for this time we have to come together and to study and get more out of our Bible reading, God, and for us to just uh, arrive at the true interpretation and meaning of the passage that we'll be studying. God, be with us, remove any distractions, be with those who are unable to be with us this evening due to traveling uh, or other health considerations, Father. We love you and we thank you in your name, amen. So as we're looking at the literary genre, if you're not familiar with what that means, uh, the literary genre is just merely the style of writing. Um, and the genre means an artistic category or stylistic that the writer of the Old or the New Testament would use and employ in their writing. And this is important for us to understand because when we approach the text, we use the same hermeneutical principles, but understanding what the genre is tells us which tools in our tool belt do we pull out to apply specifically to that passage. Now, we will use most of the tools. We don't have to use all of the tools, but as you look at the wide ver variety of the tools that we've been going over, uh, th it will help you get a better tactful approach, if you will, at getting into the text. So when we understand the literary genre, it provides the reader, us, or the interpreter, with an understanding of how to approach and read the text. Now, there are eight literary genres used in Scripture. Some might argue for more, some might argue for less, because you can technically lump some of these together. But I decided to break it down into eight. The eight literary genres that you will see primarily used throughout Scripture, the first one is law, the second one is narrative, the third one is poetry, the fourth one is wisdom, fifth one is letters, sixth one is gospel, seventh one is prophecy, and the eighth one is revelation. And in your handout, I provide which books fall into which category. Now, due to the time constraints, I'm not going to have time to go through all eight, so I'm going to pick just three out of this that I think are going to help you uh, the most. The first one is the law. When you think of the law, what typically comes to mind? The Ten Commandments, right? That's usually what comes to mind, and you're, you're right. The law also needs to be understood as the first five books of the Bible, which is also known as the Pentateuch. Now, there's over 600 commandments in these books, and the question then arises, well, which one of those commandments are we today in the New Covenant supposed to follow? And the reason why I want to focus in on the law here is because there's a lot of people who believe that some of those laws are still applicable today, and some people who think that some of those laws aren't applicable today. But the question arises, well, how do we distinguish between which law is applicable and which law is not? Well, to break that down, we got to understand that there's three types of laws, and we today as New Covenant believers, we need to understand and distinguish which one of the commandments that we're reading, what category do they fall into. And the three types of laws, the first one is the moral law. Now, the moral law is the timeless truth that is God revealing to us in his intentions for human behavior, hence moral law, morality, and or ethics. Then we have the civil laws. Those are the laws that describe aspects we usually see in a country's legal system, the courts, the economics, the land, the crimes, and the punishment. For example, you can look at Deuteronomy chapter 15, verse 1, and you can get a better understanding of that. And then finally, the ceremonial laws, those that deal specifically with sacrifices, festivals, and priestly activities. Give me a second, I need to grab some water. There it is. So, 
we as believers today, we need to look at these three laws. As we're reading through the first five books, which one of these commandments line up with us today? Does it fall under the moral category? Does it fall under the civil category? Does it fall under the ceremonial category? And there's some people today that are still trying to apply the ceremonial laws into today's living. There's still people who think that we need to be practicing the Old Testament feasts. Well, which category out of those three would Old Testament feasts fall underneath? Ceremonial laws. But I need to understand, identify, and distinguish these types, and I'm about to give you the reasons why we only adhere to the moral and no longer the civil or the ceremonial laws. The reason why we don't look at the ceremonial and civil laws and apply that to ourselves anymore, because those laws were unique and they were only applicable to ancient Israel at that time, and they no longer apply to us today. Hence, when you look at the definition of what a civil and or ceremonial law is, that is describing conditions necessary for the people of Israel at that time with what they're going through. Now, a way to help interpret these laws to determine is this moral, is this civil, or is this uh, ceremonial, is that the laws or the, the, the genre of law really falls underneath the genre of narrative. It, almost think of it as like a subgenre. And we need to understand and interpret that passage of Scripture in the way of a narrative, but then also then apply it to understanding that this is specifically adhering to the laws or what law it is. Put simply, when we approach the first five books of the Bible, we use the narrative genre, but when we come across a law, we must look at the context of that law as it fits within the overall narrative of the book or passage. And to interpret that law, we must interpret that Old Testament law through the grid of the New Testament's teaching and understanding. We understand we must interpret the Old Testament as the author intended it to be, but then we apply our New Testament understanding, once we have that Old Testament understanding, to check to see does this still apply to us today. For example, when we look at the law in the Old Testament, does Jesus speak about the law in the New Testament? Well, Jesus references the Old Testament law many, many times. And in fact, he has five areas in which he tells us and helps us understand which law is applicable for us today. The first thing we see that Jesus does is there's instances where he restates the law. And you can see in Matthew 19, 18 through 19, where he does that. The second thing, Jesus will modify the law. Well, he will just slightly ratify what it was like for them then and how it applies to us today. For example, you can see that in Matthew chapter 5, 31 to 32. And then the third one is he intensifies the law or he intensifies the meaning or he intensifies the aspect. For example, he said, you have heard it said that if you, if you have hate in your heart or if you, you shall not murder, he says, but if you have hate in your heart, that is no different than murder. So he's intensifying that aspect of the law. The fourth item that he does is he either changes the law and or its application. You can see that in Matthew chapter 5, 33 through 37 in those other verses listed. And then finally, he removes that law completely. For example, the food restrictions. He says this is no longer an issue anymore. He does it as well with Peter and Cornelius, where the sheet comes down and he says, do not call unclean what I am telling you is clean. So those are kind of the, the five aspects to help you understand which law is still applicable, why is it still applicable, and how do we know that it is still applicable as well. Jesus does not advocate, nor does he teach the continuance of the traditional Jewish approach of adherence to the law. Nor, though, does Jesus remove the law in its entirety. If you remove the law in its entirety, it leads to what is known as antinomianism, meaning no law. And we know that that is not the case. We know that the Ten Commandments are still in play. We know that the moral laws are still in play as well. We must interpret and reinterpret the law in light of Jesus' coming and the changes that the new covenant brings about. Now, the next one I want to look at, we're just going to skip down a little bit. And we're going to look at the letters and epistles. Now, I'm focusing on that because Sunday mornings, that's what we're in. We're in Paul's letter to Timothy. And tonight, when you break into your pods, you're going to be in 1 Corinthians, which is Paul's letter and or epistle to the church in Corinth. Now, over 21 of the 27 books of the New Testament are epistles or letters. And 13 of them were written by the Apostle Paul. Now, a lot of people will take these letters and or epistles and say, well, this is personal correspondence. It doesn't really have any applicability to us today. Well, if it's in Scripture and it's in the canon, it has applicability to us today in some way, shape, or form. But we have to understand, too, 
that there are theological implications in these personal letters, such as First and Second Timothy and Titus. There's theological implications to the church in Colossae, to the church in Corinth, to the church in Galatia, to the church in Ephesus. There is applicability and theological implications that we today must understand. Now, when you read an epistle, the best way to approach reading epistle is you need to read the entirety of that epistle or the entirety of that letter. You cannot just isolate one little section and think that you've grasped the authorial logic or the author's intent and why he wrote that. Because if you just read 1 Timothy and you only focus in on chapter 1 and you stop there, you're missing out on everything else that Paul is elaborating and communicating to his young apprentice, Timothy. Same thing if you read only the book of 1 Corinthians or Galatians and you just read the first chapter, like, man, this is a really harsh rebuke. I hope there's hope for them, but I guess there's not, so that means that we need to be harsh Christians also. You've got to read the entirety of the letter. And then once you read the entirety of the letter, then you can kind of narrow in and focus. Because when you are reading the letters and epistles, you have to understand that there are writings. These writings are arising out of a historical context, of, out of a historical setting. And since it's arising out of a historical setting, you have to do what is called reading between the lines. Now, there's a difference between reading between the lines and inserting what I want in between the lines. Does that make sense? I'm reading between the lines basically what the author is saying or what the author is not saying or what the author is implying. That's a large difference between reading into the text that the author is not communicating. For example, everyone likes to use Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through him who gives me strength. I can go out on that football field and accomplish anything. I can go run that Ironman without training and I can accomplish anything. But I don't understand the context that Paul, when he writes this in Philippians 4, he's saying that even though he's under house arrest, even though he's been abandoned, even though he's being persecuted, he can still make it through this situation because Christ is the one who strengthens him to make it through that situation. So if I just isolate one, or if I only just read the surface level and I don't try and get beneath the, the onion, or I don't try and get beneath the surface of the waves, I'm really missing out. So I got to understand the historical context got to understand what is the background here what what is happening so we also need to read and treat these letters from a literary point of view we need to recognize that there are carefully thought out documents paul didn't just start writing aimlessly he didn't just think this i'm just going to keep writing and see where my train of thought takes me he, he had a direct intention he had a focus he had a charge he had a mission that he was trying to convey to the people or the person to whom he was writing now the writers in these epistles they, they use a lot of rhetorical methods that are known in antiquity, which we've already actually covered. Uh, turn of phrase, we have repetition, we have compare and contrast, we have clauses. There's a lot of rhetorical methods that we need to figure out and see what is he doing here. He's repetitiously using this phrase, or he's repetitiously using this word. Why is he using this word this way? Well, what's the applicability for how he's using this word? Is there a weight or significance? Is he trying to vector us in? Is he trying to hone in our focus so that we can see this is clearly the emphasis of what he is trying to show. And a great way when you're reading through epistles, especially Paul, any of Paul's epistles, use the book of Acts as a backdrop of a historical context for how he is where he's at. Or who are the people that he's mentioning in this epistle. There's a lot of names that we've already come into contact with in the book of Acts during his missionary journeys. Where he visited on his missionary journeys. Where he stopped. How long he was there. And that helps us understand, oh... When he's writing to the church in Ephesus, we know that he's been there for three years. Well, how did you find that out, Ethan? Because I read the book of Acts, and it says, and he tarried there for three years. And so it gives us a lot more weight, and it helps us a lot more to kind of peel back those onions and see what is happening underneath the surface or what's happening in between the lines. So let's look at, real briefly, Paul's epistles, and then we also have general epistles. So Paul's epistles is the book of Romans, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, and Colossians. Those are known as his prison epistles, meaning that he was under house arrest. This is after the Acts chapter 28 when Paul writes those. Then we have the book of 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, 1st and 2nd Timothy, Titus, and then finally Philemon. Now those are Paul's specific epistles. Now we also have general epistles. We have the book of Hebrews, James, 1st and 2nd Peter, 1st and 2nd and 3rd John, and then Jude. So we can qualify now too. Paul wrote this. These are the general epistles. Because once you start to understand Paul's logic and Paul's writing style and Paul's literary context of the words and the vernacular that he uses, it's very quickly and easily um, 
something that you can apply as you're reading and studying that epistle. But I can't use my uh, knowledge on Pauline writing on, say, First and Second Peter, or on, say, the book of uh, Jude, or First, Second, and Third John. Why? Because that had a different author. I can't apply the logic that I see in Paul's writing in his epistle, the same logic over here, because it was written by different individuals. The same approach is there, but the differences in the structure and the literary context on how he is writing this out is different. So that is the epistles. This is how we need to understand the epistles. The next thing I want to look at is the prophecies, or what it would be known as the prophetic books. This is specifically in the Old Testament. Now, I'm ho focusing in on the prophetic old books because there's a lot of misunderstanding I see happening today. There's a lot of people that I see reading the Old Testament prophetic books, and they're trying to apply that into end times prophecy. Um, a lot of people have, not too many, but some people within a specific niche have been getting all out of whack about a red heifer sacrifice that might be happening or may not be happening over in the state and land of Israel. Well, what does that mean? Well, is that found in the New Testament? Is it applicable for us today? Is this something that we should be looking at for ourselves? Well, 27% of the Bible deals with predictions about the future, even though the function of the foretelling, meaning the predicting something about the future, is a less prominent feature among the prophets than that of foretelling. Foretelling is declaring God's word so as to affect personal and social changes to the glory of God. So let me say this again. A lot of times when we think of the prophetic books, we think about it being a future time, like our end time, our end state. But really that's not what's being said here. The prophetic books is not necessarily always predicting the future or telling the future. The prophetic books, if you really look at what a prophet did, he was given word from Yahweh and then he was to declare that word and it's the foretelling about what is supposed to happen, the changes that are supposed to happen, the personal repentance that's supposed to happen. And this is probably one of the more difficult genres to understand because there's nothing similar to this genre in English literature, this and also uh, the apocalyptic book of Revelation. Now, only a small percentage of the Old Testament prophecy deals with events that are future to us. Listen to that again. A small percentage, and I'm gonna give you the percentages here in a second, a small percentage of the Old Testament prophecy deals with events that are future to us. So if that is a very small percentage, and I hear people today using Old Testament passages saying that this is future for us, immediately a red flag needs to go off in my head and say, hold up, I need to look at this myself. I need to investigate this myself. I need to interpret this myself to see, is this future for us or was this future for the people group at that time? Was this future for the people who were in exile and then they're coming back after that 70 years of exile from Babylon back to Israel, or is this something for 20 whatever, whenever Christ comes back? So less than 2% of the Old Testament is messianic. Less than 2% of the Old Testament is messianic in the prophetic words. Less than 5% describes the new covenant age, the age that we live in. And less than 1%, listen to this, less than 1% concerns events yet to come in our time. So immediately, this helps set parameters, this helps set guardrails to know when I hear someone quoting out of the book of Ezekiel, or I hear someone quoting out of the book of Zechariah, and they're saying, Ethan, see, this right here, that's applicable for us in the near end time. So we need to be on the lookout because that solar eclipse is going to bring about the age of distinction and extinction for us. It's like, let me just check that with the text, because less than 1% is dealing with future events for us today. Because the majority of these prophetic books, they address the disobedience of Israel and or Judah and the consequential impending judgment. If you look at the book of Jonah, the book of Jonah was about the people where? In Nineveh. Good answer. The book of Nineveh. And so what was Jonah supposed to go and tell them to do? Repent or you're going to get destroyed. Can I look at that and say, see, Jonah's telling us here in America we need to repent or be destroyed. There is a principle in that that could be applicable for us, but that is not specifically talking to the nation of the United States. That's talking to the specific people in the city of Nineveh, and Jonah was the prophet to go and warn them to say, you need to stop, repent, and turn from your wicked ways and go back to Yahweh. 
The role of the prophet included the proclamation of the disobedience and the imminent judgment as much as it did the prediction of things to come in the more distant future. It's similar to the prophetic poetry writings that contain ample amounts of figures of speech. The focus with that, the focus of these figures of speech is to help interpret and outline a proper relationship with God requires a proper relationship with other people. Interpret the sayings of these books in their own town. Let's use those hermeneutical principles. Interpret it in their town, but then filter those principles through the New Testament. Is this principle about repenting and turning to God, is that found in the New Testament? Yes, it is. Bingo. We know that that can apply to us. The central themes of the prophetic Old Testament books is that when we are unfaithful to God, we damage our relationship with him. I think we can all agree that that is a general principle that we understand. Now, the biggest item, too, the key to interpreting prophetic books is distinguish unconditional prophecies from conditional and sequential ones. Is this unconditional, meaning I will never flood the earth because I put the rainbow in the sky? Is that unconditional? Yes, that's unconditional. Or is this conditional? You will be my people and I will be your God if you do this. And so you've got to look at the if-thens. You've got to look at, is this conditional or is this unconditional? And you can see the prophetic books that I've given to you there. And then finally, the book of Revelation. Anytime you're going into a Bible study and they say, yeah, we're going to go through the book of Revelation, you need to be very cautious and take, take, take care. There's no greater book of the Bible that is more bastardized than the book of Revelation. More people read so much into the book of Revelation because they do not understand the proper hermeneutical approach to this literary genre. They take everything as literal, they take everything as this, they take everything as that, and they misapply, they misappropriate, they look for these things, and they come up with books, and they come up with videos, and they come up with prophecies, 88 reasons why he's coming back in 88.